Today's session is our April evangelism training called Proclaiming the Resurrection of Christ, Proclaiming the Resurrection of Christ. And if you didn't know by now, uh, the reason I'm doing that is because Easter is right around the corner. And um, it's always it always affords us a great opportunity to explain to the, the world, to explain to our friends, our coworkers, our neighbors, uh, why we celebrate Easter and what it represents. Um, I think in the first session that we did, we talked about the components of the gospel and we highlighted the fact that um, you cannot really preach the gospel without preaching the resurrection. And that almost seems like a no brainer, right? But <clears throat> I'm sure there have been times in your life, definitely times in my life where I have, I have told people about their sin. I've told people about how God is holy and how Christ died for their sins, but I either leave out or have glossed over the resurrection. And that's like the most important part. So the goal for today is it's a training, but it's really more just to remind us of things we probably already know and how we can connect evangelism to the glorious, glorious message that Jesus rose from the dead. So towards that end, here is our uh, trajectory. Um, three parts. What makes the resurrection central to the gospel message? Number two, how does the resurrection answer both internal and external questions that people are asking? And three, how can we direct conversations to the resurrection of Jesus Christ? So third one would be like a little more practical, and the first two would be foundational. I think this will be a brief session, but usually when I say things like that, I go on and on. So maybe I shouldn't have said that. Okay, number one, what makes the resurrection central to the gospel message? The theology of the resurrection, an apostolic example. Why is it central? Well, um, we'll start with a quote from an old uh, Christian named John Boyce who said, the resurrection of Christ is the amen of all his promises. Everything that the Bible testifies to from the very beginning, from Genesis, hinges on the resurrection. And Paul makes that argument very clearly in this passage. So this is our main text for today. Uh, one of the most important passages in all scripture, 1 Corinthians 15. And Paul is answering objections that the Corinthians had that there, there is no resurrection. Some of them believed. And Paul um, basically says, look, you know, if, if there's a house of cards, then this is the house of cards. You take the resurrection away, the whole house falls down. You, you remove the resurrection from Christianity, you don't have Christianity. So let's listen to what he says in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning of verse 14. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Before I go to the, the next few verses, just <clears throat> look at his argumentation there, right? Um, what, would, what would be true if Christ has not been raised? First, verse 14, our preaching is in vain. That, that's, you know, when we evangelize or when we gather as a church and someone stands and takes, a time, takes time to, to proclaim the gospel, Paul's saying it's a waste of time. Like, what's the point of going to a church building or going out and talking to people? You're wasting your time. You're wasting their time. You're wasting your words. It's all in vain. It's all emptiness if Christ did not rise from the grave. And then in verse 14, he also says, your faith is in vain. So the very thing that you're trusting in is in vain. Like, you, you have this hope. You have this trust. You're, you're, you're living your life after this thing. But it's in vain. It's all emptiness because Christ is not risen, right? He, and he makes it even worse in verse 15. We are even found to be misrepresenting God. Like, whoa, that, that's huge, right? In another place, he says we're ambassadors for Christ. So we are to be representatives of the one true and living God. And Paul says here, no uncertain terms, that if Christ is still in the grave, then all of us who go out and preach, we are just misrepresenting God. Like that, that is a huge charge to lay against people, right? Um, that we would dare to misrepresent God and God who is a consuming fire, who is just and holy. Um, 
And why? Because we testified about God that he raised Christ. Verse 16, and if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. So if there's no such thing as a resurrection, then Christ can't be raised. And if Christ raised is not raised, verse 17, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. So that means that there's no good news. Um, that means that the sins you've committed are still sins you need to pay for because Christ didn't come out of the grave. That would mean that there is no forgiveness, no reconciliation, no adoption. I think the point is clear, right? What the apostle Paul is saying is that everything hinges on the resurrection. If there's no resurrection. There's no Christianity. It continues now verses 19 to 22. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Here is the message of Easter. Here's the message of every Sunday. Every Sunday is the Lord's day. Every Sunday we live in this, in the truth of the resurrection, that Jesus did not stay dead. So what is he saying? Let's just kind of parse the argument one more time. Verse 19, um, if we have, in, in Christ, we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. So, you know, really, people should feel sorry for Christians. That's his argument, right? especially in the first century. Think about it. In Paul's day, when he was talking to Corinthians, these are people who have left either their, well, especially in Corinth, their pagan Gentile ways, but also people who have left Judaism. Um, they have left behind families. They have sold their possessions in many cases. They have been persecuted, hated, thrown in prison, even killed. And that's really pathetic is what Paul's saying. You are of all people, of all people groups, of all religions, of all ethnicities, the people that should be most pitied are Christians because they are giving all their lives to something and there's no hope. There's no hope in an afterlife. Your hope is only in this life, but, but there's no reward in heaven. There's no eternal life. There's no reconciliation with God. Like you're doing all this for a lie is basically what he's saying if the resurrection <clears throat> did not happen. But he declares in verse 20, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. That word first fruits is so important. Um, the Bible often uses agricultural language because most people were very familiar. They lived in an ag agrarian uh, society. So the first fruits would be, you know, the, the crops that came out first. And the crops that came out first signified that there were more crops to follow. So Jesus is the first fruits from the dead, meaning he's the first one who resurrects and everyone who's in Christ will also rise with him. We have risen with him spiritually and one day we will rise with him bodily. So Christ's resurrection is our hope, not just in this temporal life. You know, we get 70, 80, 90 years, but Christ is the first fruits of us for eternal life. So there is more out there than simply the 80 or whatever, 100 years that God gives to us. For as a man, verse 21, by, by a man came death, that's Adam, right? In Adam, we all died. Adam is our federal head. He represents us. When he ate of the fruit, the, you can say it this way, the, the DNA has been poisoned, right? We're all guilty in a sense for what Adam did. We all inherit that sinful nature. But verse 21 goes on to say, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. So Christ is the new Adam. He's the second and better Adam. He did what Adam could not do. He perfectly obeyed God. And whereas we died in Adam, we will be made alive in Christ. So think of all in verse 22, all the things that happened because of what Adam did. The curse on the world, a world that's filled with violence and anger and hatred and sin. All of that is being reversed, right? The Adam dies, Jesus rises. It's, it's the great reversal. And all people, every single person in the world is a son or daughter of Adam. That's why all of us face death. But everyone who's in Christ by faith in Jesus will be made alive. As Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He said, if you believe in me, you pass from judgment unto life. Though he die, yet shall he live. He's, all this language of reversal. 
and it all hinges on the resurrection. So that is just in a nutshell what the Apostle Paul is saying by the inspiration of the Spirit as to why the resurrection is central to the gospel. If it is that important, if it truly is the house of cards, where if you pull it out, um, nothing else makes sense, then it has to be central in our preaching. And when I say preaching, I'm talking about any time you or I have an opportunity to talk to someone we know, or even someone we don't know on the street about the gospel, we have to find ways to drive it home to the resurrection, because that is the apostolic example. And I think I have some, well, here's just some points, all right, why the resurrection is central. <clears throat> Number one, this is to summarize, the resurrection is the hinge upon which all Christianity turns. If you've been following along with our um, bold course on unity, we talked about the three circles, and in the middle circle is the foundational um, aspects of the Christian faith. You cannot remove them. You cannot downplay them. You cannot water them down. And right in the middle of that is the resurrection. If you don't have the resurrection, you might as well just give up this whole Christian thing. Secondly, the resurrection was prophesied in the Old Testament and promised by Jesus. If he did not rise, neither Christ nor the Bible uh, can be trusted. Think, think about that. It, it, I can't trust the book of Isaiah. I can't trust the book of Jeremiah. I can't trust Genesis because all of the Bible's redemptive history, all of its prophets, even the Psalms talk about either implicitly or explicitly, like in the Psalms, it says, you will not leave my soul in Sheol. It talks about the resurrection. And so when Christ comes on the scene as the Messiah and declares himself to be the fulfillment of everything the Old Testament was about, and then he dies on the cross and he's buried, if he does not come out of the grave, it makes everything else out to be a liar. The only other option would be that Jesus himself was a liar, and we're still waiting for a Messiah. But clearly from his life, um, his birth in Bethlehem, his, um, his miracles, his prophecies, everything, clearly he was the Messiah. And so either Christ raised, was raised or was not raised, and if he was not raised, then the whole thing just falls apart. The resurrection proves that death is not the end. Death is not the end. You know, statistically, 10 out of 10 people die. The only people, who, well, we know that uh, Enoch didn't die and Elijah didn't die, but uh, Jesus, of course, died, was ascended. But you know what I mean. Uh, everybody dies. And um, the only people that will not taste death will be those who are still alive at the second coming of Christ. But, you know, 99 point infinite nines of people will experience death um, and many wonder, uh, well, what is there after death? Is there anything at all? Is death the final word? And the resurrection proves that it's not, that even death itself does not have the last word. God has the last word and death has been overcome. Um, the, the next one, the resurrection assures our justification. Um, the Bible says in Romans that he was raised for our justification. But justification is just one of the most beautiful theological words. If, if you're not familiar with it, it's a legal term um, where the judge declares someone to be innocent or righteous. We are justified. That means we are declared righteous, even though we are at the core sinners. If we're sinners, we're lawbreakers, right? John says in, in 1 John, sin is transgression of the law. Like it's, if you want a definition of sin, that's what it is. It's breaking God's law. So we're all lawbreakers who stand before a holy God. And yet God says that we are justified. How are we justified? How can God be just and yet not punish our sin? Well, because God is just, he has to punish sin. So he punishes our sin upon his righteous son. And he gives us the righteousness of his son. The great exchange, Christ taking our sin, us getting his righteousness. We are justified, not by works, not by money, not by ability, but by faith alone. But all of that said, the justification that makes us right with God would not happen if he did not rise from the grave. His rising from the grave is 
God the Father's way of validating and saying, this is my son. He has accomplished what I sent out for him to accomplish. The last words on the cross, it is finished, right? He finished the job. And to validate God's approval of that, he rises from the grave for our justification. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if he is not raised, we are still in our sins. We're not justified. The third bullet point on the screen says the resurrection means we have a living Savior. Uh, This is one of the doctrines that we need to do better at, um, I think, proclaiming, teaching, and listening to. The living Savior, the ascended Lord. Because he's risen, right, he's alive. That should go without saying, but we, we think about that, right? He's in heaven right now, seated at the right hand of the throne of God. But he's doing something because he's alive. He's a, he's, a, he's a living God, right? So that means we can know him. Because he's risen, we can have a, a relationship with God. Think of every other religion. You cannot have a relationship with Muhammad. You cannot have one with Joseph Smith, with Charles Russell, with uh, Eileen, was it Eileen White. You can't have one with Buddha. You can't have one with any of the false gods or any of the leaders that have died because they're either fake or dead. Jesus is alive. So you can have a relationship with him. Not only that, he intercedes for us. The Bible says he ever lives to make intercession for us. So he is not sitting there twiddling his thumbs. He's praying for us. He's ruling and reigning. Christ is active because he's alive. That's the resurrection power. And then uh, the last thing, on the screen is the resurrection separates Christianity from all else. And that just kind of goes along with what I just said is that it, it, all other religions are man-made, are made by a leader, a prophet, but someone who died. Many of them, you could actually go to their grave, right? But Jesus conquered death and he's alive. And that makes Christianity different than any other religion. So the resurrection is a central doctrine. I I think you probably already knew that, but I hope that I convinced you in case you didn't. And then the apostles, right? When they went out preaching, that was their, that was their message. If you, you look at the book of Acts, every sermon that's preached in the book of Acts focuses on the resurrection. In, In Pentecost, Peter focused on God raising up Jesus and making him the reigning Lord and Christ. You can find that in Acts chapter two. You can find in Acts 4 and 5, the apostles respond to the authorities' complaints by pointing to the resurrection. You know, they were very mad that the apostles were preaching. Um, They they felt threatened. But the the response to that was, what we're saying is grounded in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul preaches, when Paul gets converted, he preaches the resurrection in Acts 13, 17, 22, and 26. All that to say is, what was the apostolic example? The apostolic example is not, you know, a Roman's road formula or four spiritual laws. And there's nothing wrong with formulas necessarily, but it was the resurrection of Christ. The apostles saw the resurrection as a turning point in world history, ushering in the seeds of the new world that includes all nations under the lordship of Jesus Christ. The resurrection is central. Second point. How does the resurrection answer both internal and external questions that people are asking? The relevance of the resurrection. Let me just explain what I mean by this question. Um, People are hurting in our world, right? They're hurting. They're frustrated. They're cynical. They're angry. They're irritated. Um, How does the resurrection answer their internal questions? That is like the questions of their soul that they're not saying out loud. And the questions that they are asking. So you know, people take to the airwaves. They, they protest. They put uh, posters up. And, and clearly, they, they're, they have questions, like real questions. I think most people can see that the world is broken, right? But they're looking to the world to answer its own problems. And that's the, that's the issue. So how can the resurrection be relevant to the problems that people are experiencing and answer those questions? So I just have a few broad examples of questions that people might be asking, whether internally or externally. Uh, First of all, why is there suffering in the world? 
It's a fair question, right? This world is filled with oppression, disease, crime, all sorts of suffering. Well, the resurrection does answer that question because it focuses everything on Jesus Christ. And the message that the Bible tells us is that suffering is a result of sin. Now, by the way, I don't mean in any way to say that someone who's really hurting and questioning is just going to like, if you say suffering is a result of sin, they're going to be like, oh, okay. Um, you know, it, it takes a long time to, to understand that. But it really is the only message that makes sense, right? God has placed a curse upon this world because it is broken because of our sin. But sin is what led Christ to the cross, right? Christ did not die for his own sin because Christ never sinned. He died for our sins. He died at the hands of unjust people who put him on the cross, right? Um, the only innocent person ever to die and suffer is Christ. I'm not saying that everyone who's suffering in other lands are suffering in relation to their personal sin. But what I am saying, and I think the Bible clearly says this, is that no one is innocent. So even the person who is suffering unjustly from the world's perspective is still a sinner who deserves God's wrath. All of us deserve God's wrath. But the only truly righteous person, you know, why do bad things happen to good people? The only good people, the only good person ever is Jesus. And the bad thing that happened to him was he was put on the cross, not for anything he did. But we know that, you know, it wasn't bad ultimately because it was God's will. That's why we call it Good Friday. So sin put him there. However, the resurrection demonstrates that sin and suffering have an expiration date. And I just, I love that phrase because it's not some trite, I mean, it could, you can turn anything into a trite expression, right? But it's so chock full of truth. I think Tolkien said, everything sad will come untrue, right? It's that you can offer hope to people who are wondering, why am I suffering? Why is my family suffering? Why are people across the world suffering? And you can resonate with their, you don't dismiss it. You say, yeah, you're right. Suffering is awful. It's a result of sin, and my Savior suffered too, and he knows exactly what they're going through, even if I don't. But the good news is suffering has an expiration date. The curse has an expiration date. Sin has an expiration date. And how do I know that? Because Christ rose from the dead. Second question, what is the point of life, right? What is the meaning of life? Why are we here? Well, the resurrection is God's validation of his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The only true way to live is to know Christ. And the resurrection demonstrates that he is worth following. I don't think any person in the world will ever have enough time to um, evaluate every single religion, every single philosophy. Um, we have to look at what the claims are and ask which one really makes life worth living. And if you just boil down every other way, every other way that's offered, it's more like self-help, right? What can I do to make myself better? And if there is a God or gods or heaven or paradise, work my way there and earn it. Christianity says, no, you can't earn it because you are broken and only God is holy and perfect and just and righteous. And he did the work for you. He sent his son. And if you know his son, you find fulfillment. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have life more abundantly. So Jesus' resurrection proves the abundant nature of the life he wants to give us. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, right? He brings us home to his father's house. Do you think about it? What love is this? If Jesus is the son, right? And sin is transgression of the law. That means that you and I, by virtue of our sin, we have committed what R.C. Sproul called cosmic treason against the king of the universe. And the king of the universe, who has been offended by our sin, by taking his beautiful world and polluting it and bringing crime into it and sin into it, and he has every right to wipe us out, and yet he gave us the best gift that can be given. He gives us his son 
to take the penalty for us. And then not just to wipe away our sins and say, okay, you're forgiven, go on your way, but to then bring us into the very castle that we tried to storm so we can have an abiding relationship with him and the very son that he gave us to die for the sins that we committed then turns around and says to us, whatever you ask my father in my name, I will give to you. That's amazing, right? And how do I know this is all true? Because the resurrection, it demonstrates that this life in Christ is worth living. It's worth praying. It's worth worshiping. It's worth gathering. It's worth being hospitable. It's worth sending missionaries or being a missionary. It's worth denying yourself. It's worth mortifying your flesh. It's worth saying no to the things of the world. It's worth saying yes to the things of God. All the things that you and I do that are different than what our classmates, our coworkers, our family who are not in Christ do is worth it in Christ. Christ shows us the point of life. So the, the question, what is the point of life? It's kind of like when Thomas said, how do we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. People may ask, what happens when we die? That's another question, right? Um, people are, when they become aware of their own mortality or when they go to a funeral of a loved one, um, death is the most, it, it's the darkest thing, right? Because we don't actually know or do we. We'd like to say, well, if someone went there and came back, they can tell us, well, there's one man that we know that did, and that's Jesus Christ. And so our faith helps us to answer this question because we can trust when the Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die and after this to judgment because Christ proved that death is not final. But I want to pause here and just remind you that that is both scary and hopeful. It's scary because if death is not the last word, that every soul will have to give an account to God. So it's not that you die and you're just unconscious forever and you, that's it, you just cease to exist, but you die and your soul is judged before God. And if you're not in Christ, if your sins have not been washed away, that is a very scary thought. But if you are in Christ, you have that hope that all the sins that you've committed have been done away with in Christ. And as God promises, their sins and their iniquities, I will remember no more. The resurrection helps us to understand that there is life after death, but it's either going to be judgment or uh, heaven for those who trust Christ. And one more question is, does anyone care about me? People may not say this out loud. Some people might, but there are many that are struggling with wondering, does anyone love them? Does anyone care about them? And the resurrection shows us God's demonstration of love for sinners. God sent his son into the world to bear the penalty for sinners like you and me. The message of the resurrection speaks directly to us because Christ died for humans. And if you're human, right, Christ died for your race. There's only one race, the human race. God demonstrated his love for us in the cross and invites all people to repent and trust in the living Christ for salvation. And so for those who wonder if there's anyone out there that cares, they need to look no further than to the cross, but not just the cross, the empty tomb, which validates the cross. And in that, they will see that they have a loving God. Is there hope for this world? Indeed, the curse, this cursed world is filled with injustice, crime, violence, hatred, and the like. The resurrection assures us there is a new world coming, but only in Christ, the first fruits. Remember that word, first fruits, in 1 Corinthians. The seeds have budded, the plants have sprouted, Christ is alive, and everyone who's in Christ is made alive. But it's only those who are in Christ and made alive by Christ that will be inhabiting this new heavens and new earth. There will be the new heavens and new earth. There will be no more cancer. There will be no more disease. There will be no more injustice, no more oppression, no more sin, no more crime, no more sorrows. And God himself will wipe away every tear. And so when people wonder, is there hope for this world? And they do all sorts of things to try to create a better world, right? Just better welfare programs, better education, better medicine, better technology. Um, and these are things I'm not saying we should be against necessarily, and I understand why people want to do that. And while we're here, we should work to make things better for people. But ultimately, because we're sinners, it will not be any sort of utopia made by man. It will only be the new heavens and the new earth that God gives to those 
who believe in Christ. And the resurrection proves that that new earth is coming, but it's only coming in him. So finally, so, so with those two big questions, like why is the resurrection so central? And then secondly, how does it answer the questions people have? Let me give some practical things about how we can direct conversations to the resurrection of Christ. Because that's what we want our loved ones to, to hear, right? And that's what we want to proclaim when we go out to the streets of Kearney or anywhere else. Uh, and we are proclaiming the good news. How do we get there? And I just have very simple, three very general categories, ask, proclaim, or share. And you can do one, two, or all three of these things. And it all depends on the given situation, right? So one way to direct people to the resurrection is to ask direct questions. Um, for example, you might ask someone, what do you think happens when you die? Look, I, and I understand that depending on your relationship with the person, it can become tense when you ask these types of questions, right? But it's, I think, really important for us as Christians uh, to be listeners and um, to, to be good listeners to the people that are um, in our lives. And one way to listen is to ask them questions, questions that they might be asking, right? So just ask your coworker um, if the Lord gives you that opportunity, what happens when you die? What do you think about the claim that Jesus rose from the dead? Easter is just an awesome time to do that, right? Um, you may have people in your life who, you know, celebrate Easter by doing Easter egg hunts and candy and all that and have no concept at all. But because it is Easter Sunday, you can ask, hey, um, you know, Easter is, it comes from uh, the idea that Christ rose from the grave. What do you think about that? And just listen to what they say. Um, you may ask a question like, have you ever wondered if life has a purpose? Um, I have found that, and I, I, I should do this more often, but the times that I do just ask people questions, most people want to be heard. They want to give their opinion. And um, when you show them that you can listen to them, usually a door is open for you to respond with truth. The second one is to proclaim. Proclaim means to preach, to announce, to herald. We hear those words, we often think, oh, that means I have to be behind a pulpit or on the street corner. Not necessarily. You can proclaim something by sitting down and you could even whisper it, right? But proclaim just means you're declaring something to be true. Um, you know, lately when I hand out tracts to people, I'll try to start with good news, Christ died for our sins, or good news, Christ conquered death. Um, it kind of, I just, I feel like I need kind of a formula just so that I can break the ice, you know, because even though I'm a pastor, it doesn't mean like I'm not afraid. Like I, I really need courage to go up to people and, and talk to them. Um, but I think that if you start like the apostles did and just proclaim it, right. When I think of the word herald, I think of like uh, those movies from like the 1920s with uh, the newspaper boy on the corner, you know, extra, extra, read all about it. You're just like proclaiming to the world, just like you would if your favorite team won the world series and you go to work the next day and you're like, did you see what happened last night at the world series? Uh, this is what we do. Water cooler conversations. And, and uh, you know, if you got a new car, or you just had a kid or your kid graduated, or, you know, everyone talks about what happened at the Emmys. Right. And, um, or the, or the Oscars, I guess whatever it was. Um, we talk about these news stories. We have the best news to share. We have the news that somebody came out of the grave so we could just proclaim it, but don't manufacture that. I mean, you have to delight yourself in the Lord, be excited. Um, I want to get to a point where I can more easily and more organically just proclaim the truth of Christ without it feeling forced or manufactured. Um, so proclaim the truth. God is making all things new. Jesus died for our sins. Christ rose from the grave. These are amazing things. Ask questions, proclaim the truth. And then thirdly, you could also share, share your testimony. Make it personal, right? If you have a relationship with someone um, at work or at school or whatever, um, you know, they, if you can normally tell them about you, like, hey, I got a raise at work or um, I don't know, something, I, 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 narrowly avoided a car accident over there on that street, you know, and you talk to your neighbor about these things. And why is it that we can't insert our relationship with God into the mix? Why is it so hard for us? If we just so easily talk to our neighbors and our, our classmates about what happened to us at the grocery store, you know, why can't we also say, Hey, I'm excited because this Sunday I get to celebrate Easter with my church or, um, you know, today I was feeling down, but 
I just realized that God forgave me for my sins and it really encouraged me. Or it's a treasure to know Christ. Or this morning I spent, I spent time in prayer and God really spoke to me through his word and I was so unburdened to give him my burdens. Uh, we don't always talk like that naturally, but if there's an opportunity for us to share a testimony, again, not in a forced or manufactured way, but in a sincere way, um, I think that would be one way for us to direct conversations uh, to the resurrection of Christ. So ask direct questions, proclaim the truth, share your testimony. Um, now, just a couple clarifying things. Whether you ask, proclaim, or share requires wisdom about your relationship with the person you are speaking with. Jesus told us to be harmless as doves, wise as serpents. So ask God for wisdom and practice, right? The more you practice telling people about the gospel, um, the easier it will become. So it's not the same. Not, not everyone is someone that you would ask questions to. Not everyone is someone you proclaim to. Um, and you have to ask God to help you with that. Secondly, trust that since Christ rose from the grave, the proclamation of the gospel has power to save. I have to remind us, I got to remind myself of this too, because we can go to these trainings and we could, we could learn about the formula or we could learn about the strategy. And that is important. I think we should take this that seriously that we want to grow and learn. But this is not the same thing as um, whatever kind of trainings you have on the job or, or whatever, where if you don't do things exactly right, it can mess everything up because it doesn't rely upon you and it doesn't rely upon me. We are called to scatter seed. God is the one who gives the increase, right? We are the ones who tell people about Jesus. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation, which means you're not going to woo someone into heaven. You're not going to lure them into heaven with your words. You're not going to convince them into heaven. You're not going to argue them into heaven. You can only proclaim the gospel and is God himself who takes out the heart of stone, puts in a heart of flesh, and draws people to himself by the power of the Holy Spirit. And if that is true, and it's true that Christ rose from the grave, and there is resurrection power in these words, then I can have confidence, not in myself, not in my strategy, not in my formula, but in the gospel itself. And it gives me more faith and trust in God. Finally, remember, remember that we are called to be witnesses for Jesus. The whole theme of the book of Acts, right, is that the apostles witnessed the risen Lord, and then they go out to witness. I think I've said this in the beginning of the book of Acts here in Kearney, that um, the noun comes before the verb. Um, when you go to court, before you witness on the stand, you have to be a witness. They don't call anybody, right? They call people who are witnesses of the crime or whatever. So the apostles, in order to witness, must first be witnesses. They had to have seen the Lord. One of the qualifications for an apostle is that they've seen the risen Christ. So how does that relate to us? Because we often use that word, I'm going to go out witnessing, or I witnessed to my neighbor today. But you're not an apostle. You haven't actually seen the risen Lord. But we are personally impacted by him. If you're a Christian, you have been impacted by the risen Lord you are a witness to what God has done in your life based upon your profession of faith in Christ Jesus. And so even though you haven't seen him, you believe in him. And because you believe in him, you love him, you trust him, you follow him. So if you are a true Christian, yes, you are a witness. And since you are a witness to the power of the risen Lord, then we can be witnesses to the world. We can bring glory to the name and we can just trust God with the results.